Konnichiwa. Welcome to the Jandals in Japan podcast. Hey, Catherine, how's it going? Hi, Jane. It's so hot. Isn't it's it? so hot. It's not supposed to be this hot. No. I have to say, I am trying not to have a panic attack on a daily basis, thinking about how many more months of hotness we have to get through before it cools down again. Exactly. It's way too early. It's June, right? It's June. And normally we're in rainy season, but in Tokyo, it's been declared already that rainy seasons has officially finished. Yeah. And it wasn't even really a rainy season. It wasn't that muggy. It wasn't that. No. no like it normally is. The, rain, no. the amount of water that has fallen is, you know, the rain water levels are quite low. So yes. uh, water shortages yes. coming this summer, I believe, That's as well as power worry. shortages. Yes. yes. In Tokyo, they have been conserving energy. Like convenience stores are not frying or refilling display cases mm-hmm. between 3 and 6 p.m. That's 7-Eleven. Right. And I heard Family Mart also just like turning off the lights. Oh, my God. Wow. Right. I think they could turn off a few lights and everything will be fine. Yeah. It's going to be okay. Especially yeah. like inside refrigerators and things. It's it's not necessary. No. no. I think this is great to get rid of some of that power consumption. It doesn't need to happen. We'll all survive. And we will know that your 7-Eleven is still open. <laughs> it's always yeah. open, right? Well, Even if the lights are not all on inside. Yeah, 7-Eleven yeah, were doing the cabinets and then Family Mount taking that different tack, doing 60% less lighting. I think it'll be bright enough. It's always far too bright, mm. as you say, in those exactly. convenience stores. Yeah, right. Yeah. The level of lighting in Japan is really bright anyway. So, yeah, yeah. I'm sure it's going to be fine. But I'm concerned about... You know, just your average Jijan Bajan, you know, the elderly mm. thinking that they have to conserve power. Yeah. And then exactly. getting heat stroke and, yes. you know, ending up in hospital or worse. And, and that yeah. does happen in Japan. It really yep. does. We see mm. all those reports of the elderly being very, very good and conserving and, and, yeah. and not drinking water and keeping, keeping their fluids up. And that's really important. Mm. Yeah. We have to watch out for that this time of year, the old heat exhaustion. And uh, I just heard a, f- a friend mention that, you know, they did everything right, but they still got heat exhaustion. So just really to be really yeah, careful. Yeah, be very careful. Mm, yeah. Mm, and I mean, obviously for Kiwis coming to Japan, June, you may think it's pretty mild, but actually it's really rocketing. It's, you know, been 34, 35. Japan reached a record just the other day. Uh, Gunma, I think, had 40.2, mm. which is the highest in 30 something years. Um, so yeah yeah, Mm. so let's just be careful out there and come ready sunblock yeah what would be Um, your top tips the top tips for avoiding a heat stroke definitely keeping up the water but some of the water i think needs to have saline in it yes that's the thing isn't it that is what is going to save you is the salt yeah Yeah, and it's either in a tablet a salt tablet or um, a sports drink or an umeboshi a pickled plum, yes. which is what, what a lot of my Japanese friends carry around with them as pickled plums. Right. And they suck on those uh, for yeah. the salt content. So but, one of those a day in your breakfast yeah. to help you get through the day. Really, really good. I also just like plain old rock salt. I will actually just have some on the tip of my tongue. Yeah. And that's apparently that's, that's a real salt. boost yeah. just suddenly to get some saline into your system. Mm. Yeah. Especially Other if you're tips. having headaches, right? That yeah. means you need more salt. Or if you're feeling thirsty. Mm. I saw for sale, they've got these cooler pads that you can pop inside a cap that you wear. Oh, yes, right. They've gone on sale here that they are very popular walking out of loft stores, apparently. Mm. They look really, really great. You can put them under your hat. I don't know that I really like a cold head, but you do lose a lot of your heat outside of your head. So maybe that's not really the place to cool it. Maybe that's a natural ventilation system through your head, but... Yeah, well, that's uh, where the, the sun hits you, right? Especially if you've yeah. got dark hair. If you're like a Japanese person with black hair, you're very easy to get right. heat stroke through your head if you're not wearing a hat. So, yes. yeah, that's the whole thing around hats in summer. And and everybody's always wearing a hat. And you think, oh, that looks really hot. But it's actually saving them from... <laughs> well, that makes sense. Yeah, that's right? probably why this product's come out. And the other thing, I think, you see a lot of ladies having parasols and umbrellas. And, I mean, yeah. maybe that's not popular in New Zealand, and New Zealand. Yeah, and but it's Japan your own, popular, right? Yeah, Using own portable shade is fantastic. It makes a huge difference having one of those parasols that looks so ancient, but actually 
very, very good idea to have. And this. always having a hand fan in my bag. And sometimes right. the ones that are the Uchiwa, not the ones that are fanned out, but the ones mm -hmm. that are uh, um, mm -hmm. Uchiwa. <laughs> mm -hmm. When I came to Japan, I did not know to look for the shade. Ah, I did not know that that would make a huge difference. You know, like really? where are I? I'm from Southland. It doesn't get that oh, hot I there, see. right? So I You're never excused. had this experience. You of, are excused, my dear. Right? Yeah. <laughs> and I would spend my summers in Milford Sound where it isn't, it's just rains, you know, it's uh -huh. not that sunny, right? So I came to Japan and I was like, wow, what, what, what do I do? I didn't know what to do. And I did not know to walk on the shady side of the street or to look for the shade. And now I'm all about the shade. I'm like, okay, in the morning, the shade that way, take walk the dog that way. Yeah. So Very even good. just crossing the street is a huge difference. And you'll see the Japanese people all walking in the shade, but just the dumb foreigner who doesn't know uh, right. walking in the sunshine. But anyway, I well, digress. So <laughs> what I was trying to say with the Uchiwa, which is the fan that doesn't close up, is it is also quite a good protection on your shading oh, on your face. So you if can you're make not shade with it. Fanning mm. yourself, you can make a shade with it too. So that's mm. another tip that I have. Always have one on every single bag of mine. Mm. Oh, yes, definitely. Mm -hmm. Woo, yeah. Let's get through this heat. Yes, yes, exactly. Oh and the other God. lovely thing that's been happening, Jane, too, is Matariki. We've been just seeing so much of that exploding in New Zealand and how lovely it is to see the celebration happening there around Matariki. And, and it's lovely to see that it did filter through to Japan here and we felt a little bit homesick, didn't we, we over that did. weekend to know yes. that New Zealanders were spending time with their families and we couldn't be with our families but also a time to spend remembering family members who have passed on as well. And here in Japan, if you live in Japan, you'll know that we have Obom, which is a three days of taking care of your ancestors who have passed on, visiting family graves, reuniting with family members, spending time together and welcoming the spirits of your ancestors to your home for the three days and then sending them on their way again. Mm -hmm. So I I really like Obom. <laughs> it's mm. kind of like people might think it's morbid, but I don't think it is. It's really lovely. And it's I'm celebration, really isn't it? It's well, yeah, it's of it's, their I lives, remembering, remembering them, remembering, yeah, them, showing respect them. and remembrance for the people who in your family who have passed on. But it's really great to see New Zealand bringing that into something that everybody can take part in and to remember to remember. And that beautiful connection of that, that cultural connection between New Zealand as well, having those chances to remember your ancestors is really great. Yeah, we have another connection there on remembering mm. ancestry, and I think that's going to be brilliant for us too going forward that we can see some other connections developing in different ways. Mm. So it's really great. Yeah. Yeah. So coming on the show today, we have Greg Lane. We do. Greg's just, wow, is he not someone who just continues to go up the hill to strive with his jandals on forward. with his jandals <laughs> on yes what a guy he just has done so much in japan and just is a trooper i'll give mm. him that yeah he just keeps going and going and going ever ready battery type person but yes with his jandals <laughs> on mm. i hope everyone enjoys the episode yes here let's have here from greg kia ora greg kia ora konnichiwa greg konnichiwa Welcome to the show. Thanks for joining us today. We have a special warm-up question for you. A or B, mm -hmm. which are you? Okay. Takoyaki or okonomiyaki? Uh, I think takoyaki. Why is that? That's a good question. Um, well, part of it is because it's cheaper, so that kind of goes with my, um, my brand. Um, and... I guess it's just a little bit less sloppy. You know, you can kind of eat it with a toothpick, whereas the uh, okinomiyaki, you know, gets all over your shirt. and um... It gets over your shirt, maybe. But... <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, it usually goes with beer. It's quite kind of, you know, yeah. usually a lot of, you know, loud talking and uh, gesticulation. How about you, Catherine? Takoyaki, Ooh, okonomiyaki? Okonomiyaki for me. Oh, why is that? I just... Love it. I think takoyaki also just, I think, automatically of the translation of it as octopus balls. And it makes me go, oh, no, thank you. So I, you know, go for okonomiyaki. I love pancake style. I like that I can cook it myself too on the hot plate. 
and add in bits and pieces that I want. I don't mind if it's Hiroshima yaki with noodles or if it's X, Y, Z. I like Okonomiyaki and I just like the old you know, DIY aspect to it, making my own on the, on the hot plate. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Jane? Well, I married someone from Totori who has a supply of Nagaimo, which is the long potatoes that they use. And so we have it quite a lot of okonomiyaki, very high quality okonomiyaki. So I'm not really a fan. I was like, I've had too much of it. I prefer takoyaki, but I actually like it when we cook it ourselves at home and we do like all your own original ingredients inside the takoyaki, because there are actually a lot of things that go a lot better than tako inside takoyaki, like oh, maybe that's wiener it. or um, ika squid or other there's things a, that we put in. There's a beef in. version as well, right? I have not had a beef version. Oh. Well, I, I Tell I me about meat, that. But, um, yeah. That's another reason why I don't like uh, uh, okonomiyaki. Well, I mean, obviously okonomiyaki, you can put whatever you want in it, but uh, it typically comes with pork, so I don't need any of that. It does, yeah. doesn't it? Yeah, you yeah. could make a vegetarian version if you wanted, yeah. Yeah, I think I quite like the vegetarian version, but I hadn't even thought about beef or something beef else Beef in the takoyaki. Mm. Yeah, you can put all kinds of things in takoyaki. So okay. that's what we next like to time, do when we cook it at home. Yeah. Next time I visit you, Jane, please, I request we'll have a, a, takoyaki party. a different yeah. style and I'll guess what's inside. But we wanted to have you on the show because, well, you've been here for such a long time. 23 years is, is amazing. You established several businesses um, and you're an entrepreneur, right, with Fast Train Limited as your umbrella company that you do all sorts of things under. And one of the things you mentioned before about uh, cheap was that you are, in fact, the originator of Tokyo Cheapo and a few other uh, city guides as well for people who are looking for things to do online. And so why did you choose Japan? You could have chosen anywhere. Tell uh, us about how you got going. Yeah, yeah, tell us. Yeah. Uh, it's kind of simple. I met um, a Japanese woman in, in New Zealand. And at the time, I was kind of um, in a sales job and I kind of realized that I hated sales and I, I wanted to get out. and. I was thinking, might as well go to Japan. <laughs> so, you know, <laughs> it wasn't like a lifelong dream or like something intentional or anything. It was just um, kind of accidental. So you ended up in Japan. You followed a love interest to Japan. Yeah, yeah. I don't I don't have any of those kind of, t- you hear a lot of these, you know, people talk about how they have a, a love of anime or martial arts or um something but i really don't have i didn't have any of that kind of connection with japan before i came and so arriving here you started off as an english teacher is that right that's correct yeah, yeah. i worked at uh, nova after nova i um i got a job working at an it company so i you know got into things like you know web design and and uh i, I guess it improved my japanese a lot because it was going from speaking very elementary japanese to working in a japanese company so um, that was kind of, you know, being thrown in the deep end. So yeah, and the, um, right. you know, just things like all the, um, uh, for want of a better term, you know, the, the, they say office ladies in Japan. They would they would prepare the the tea and coffee in the afternoon and you know the morning and afternoon and stuff. And I I would go in and, and help them, and people would kind of like hit me because like no no you can't do this. It's not your job. So, you know. Wow, really? <laughs> Get out of the kitchen, kind of stuff. Yeah, 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 yeah. that kind of thing. So you know, yeah, it was um very weird. I didn't really enjoy it very much working at a Japanese company and, you know, being the salary man. And I had a 90 minute commute each day. So rough. yeah, it was rough. It was like, mm. it was, it was on the Odaku line. So um, on a bad morning, it would be raining. It would be hot, like in a rainy season kind of thing. I'd be in the middle of the carriage, like not near the doors. And I'd still have my face against the glass because, you know, there was such a crush and I'd have like someone's head against my stomach. <laughs> so, um, oh my God. It, it wasn't yeah. it wasn't pleasant. I think it's improved a little bit on that line. I used to take that line out to my last corporate job and I was going but I was going the opposite direction to people coming mm-hmm. into the city. So I actually had quite a good ride. I didn't get squashed like that, thank goodness. Yeah, yeah. So that, that, that taught me all about um, you know, Japanese corporate life. Mm-hmm. So I, I I quit and I went back to some kind of part-time English teaching and I did the freelancing on the side. So I kind of gradually transitioned into um, you know, working in IT for myself. Um, and that led into a company called Fusion Bureau, which was a design studio, which I set up with a couple of other guys. Um, and we did that for about three or four years. It kind of stumbled along. It did okay every now and then, but um, it was kind of finished off by the earthquake in 2011. Mm-hmm. So um, 
you know, so we had a few contracts and then 2011 came along and then basically all of the contracts got cancelled and it just wasn't viable anymore. So at that point I was doing freelance stuff and I was looking for something else to do. And I met up with my friend, uh, Chris Kirkland, and, and we decided to, why, what kind of why we were thinking of something better to do, we'll just start a blog about, you know, how to do stuff cheap in Tokyo. So that was the kind of genesis of the, the business. We intended it for, it for it to be a business from the start. It wasn't like a complete hobby kind of blog. So we had mm -hmm. that intention, but it really took off a lot faster than we anticipated. And uh, by about 2016, I was working full time on the site and then it basically went from strength to strength up until 2020 so yeah you know 2019 was amazing we had the rugby world cup yeah um we had a team of about 20 people and we you know we obviously launched a few other sites too we had um japan cheapo for the rest of japan we had um london cheapo 2019 we launched uh hong kong cheapo mm. uh, and then that year we had a team of about yeah, about 20 people and we were you know flying all around the world and having um, meetups and, and staff events and things. And then, uh, yeah, 2020 came around and, and uh, basically, um, you know, traffic dived within the space of about two weeks. We went from 2 million page views uh, a month down to around 200,000. And, and basically for the last two and a bit years, we've been uh, on what we call eco mode. So we've just been you know, ticking, ticking over, trying to keep the content up to date, but waiting for the, um, the tourists to come back. Any tips then on how to design content development or social marketing, say if a Kiwi is coming in mm -hmm. here or what, and wants to tell their story of how they produce their product or promote yep. activations of their products? I think that might be quite interesting for people to know. Having a content strategy, like deciding, um, you know, what kind of content you're going to produce, connecting with some good writers. And I think you just have to be consistently producing content, looking at what's working, what's not, doubling down on what's working, you know, forgetting what isn't. It's not rocket science. It's not, not that hard. And, and it kind of applies equally to, um, to Japanese content as it does to English. Although I think we're in a, an easier niche because, um, you know, if you're looking at the English speaking population in Japan versus the Japanese speaking population in Japan, then, you know, there's 125 million versus 1 million or something. So um, there's a lot more competition in the, on the, the Japanese language side, but it's, it's still possible. Like I, I actually ran a, a Japanese language site an events site for a company and not my Japanese is not great. And like, you know, some of the um, descriptions I, I translated myself, but I managed to get it up to about hundred to 200,000 page views within a year. So the, the same strategies that are used on the English content worked on the Japanese content, which kind of surprised me. When you had those challenges, you know, with mm -hmm. the, the previous business and things went wrong, you could have just left, but you stayed. And so you've got some resilience or keep going yeah. character going on there. But do you well, think that's more about you rather than uh, being a Kiwi as such? I, I actually think that's partly a character flaw. I think, um, I think, <laughs> Successful entrepreneurs are the, are the exception. I think most people, um, you know, being stubborn and not giving up on something is, is, is a problem. You should, you know, you need to know when to move on. I think in my, my case, I was kind of lucky. I was in the right time at the, you know, right place at the right time. Like when we started Tokyo Cheapo, it was, it was straight after the earthquake. It was at the beginning of the, um, you know, the tourism boom in Japan. So, mm. you know, the timing was perfect Even um, at the time. 2012 right. though like japan was still severely damaged from yep. that earthquake like, obviously living in fukushima i very much experienced that and i just sort of thought who would come to japan <laughs> for a trip yeah let alone you know who would come to an olympics here because then they started getting ready for the olympics mm -hmm. and i thought that was just insanity but you know hey it, it worked out in the end yeah so yeah having that ability to sort of see past the these sort of temporary things like a tsunami earthquake and nuclear meltdown to create a business around tourism that that's a lot of foresight that you and your partner had that's i find that's really good Amazing. yeah i mean we saw potential because i mean the you know the idea was um at the time you know it's, it's in the name tokyo cheaper we thought the, the image of Japan was being really, really expensive and mm. overpriced. And, you know, we looked online and we saw people on social media, they would be sharing um, their holiday plans and they're saying, 
I want to go to Asia, but Japan's too expensive. So we're probably going to go to Hong Kong, you know, there was a lot of talk like that. So I think we, one of the things is we wanted to change that perception that, you know, Japan wasn't this kind of extremely expensive place where, you know, you would lose all your money, you know, on on the first day. Yeah, exactly. I mean, Japan's been in deflation for the last 20 years, not inflation. And so prices have basically changed, not changed right now. There's going to be movement, but yeah. It's been the same prices, really. In the yeah, yeah. I, I remember the, when I first came here, the exchange rate to the New Zealand dollar was um, it was thirty eight yen to the New Zealand dollar. <gasps> no, <laughs> oh my god, so, it must have felt so poor. Gosh. Oh yeah, yeah. Coming here, it's like um, I was looking at you know the vending machines, and they were you know drinks were one hundred and twenty yen, and I was thinking, wow, three three dollars for a drink, and was, you know this is insane. And, and now, and, and now it's, it's the other way around. Yen. I go back to New Zealand, and I see, wow pump you know there's some kind of like water pump thing you get in the in the supermarket for four dollars or something it's you know yeah it's insane yeah it's interesting that that uh, that japan is expensive still is the mindset that's out there though even now yeah that japan is an expensive place yeah so which is so not true and we hope that more more and more people will get to know that it's actually a rather affordable place to come yeah totally to these days yeah with the help of tokyo cheapo <laughs> Yay. In Japan, cheapo. Well, yeah, Japan has a sort of business culture here that often people call unique, Greg. And mm-hmm. I wonder how you've managed to navigate that. I remember one thing. It was in my previous business when we were looking for customers, and um, a lot of our customers were, were, you know, foreigners in Tokyo. And and the way we got those customers was we would go to a, a pub or an event or something, and we'd have a drink and we'd meet, start talking, and you know. You know, two days later, we'd have a meeting and would, you know, just sign a contract or get into something. And I was doing that a lot with Japanese people as well. And I was, you know, like I would be meeting a bar or, or um, you know, at, at some event and I, I'd kind of would exchange business cards and have a, have a chat. It's like, oh, they're in the same you know, industry. We could do something. The next day I'd send them an email and I never got a reply. People don't do business that way. If you introduce yourself in a bar, you're just some dude that introduced yourself in a bar. You're not you know, you need that intro, you need that kind of that trust. The hit rate with foreigners in Japan, when I would you know, send an email, it was about nine and 10, whereas with Japanese people, it would be like one in 10, you know? Good point, right? I mean, you might meet Japanese people for a constructed interview, meeting, mm-hmm. gathering, and then go and have some drinks. And then you might, that's different, right? Yeah. To actually meeting someone randomly in a bar. It's a really yeah. good point, actually. Yeah. Mm. What about, yeah, any other pitfalls that you see foreigners making in business? Something I see a lot is people relying too much on someone's English ability. So mm-hmm. quite often when, they, when they're coming into Japan, they'll look for a, like a country manager who speaks really fluent English. And I think when you, when you look for someone who speaks really fluent English, you're cutting down the options. You know, your talent pool gets cut down really, really small. Mm-hmm. And you're basically just fishing in that pond where all the other you know, international companies are trying to find someone. So sure. I think... Something that could work quite well is um, the combination, like find, connect with a foreigner in Japan and get them to, you know, recruit a Japanese person. They don't have to um, speak perfect Japanese, but, you know, you've got that kind of two sides rather than trying to find the perfect Japanese country manager who, who understands your culture completely and also Japan as well. Yeah, not be hellbent on the language side of things. Yeah. But how those people with sort of, pretty good English, pretty good Japanese can bring their skills and knowledge and expertise yeah, rather absolutely. than yeah. focus on the language. Yeah. That's a great point. Mm. Really great point. Anything else? The government contacts are really good. You know, like I, was, I mentioned, um, like getting intros and stuff. Generally, people you know, regard intros from, um, you know, bureaucrats and, and you know, government people as being pretty good. So it is actually a pretty good way to um, get into the country. I think, you know, Jetro and things. Is that... Like meeting the government people, is that after you've got here? When you, what sort of government people are you talking about? You're talking about people who issue visas or you're talking about people who give you licenses or what, what sort of person? I mean, this is more of a, a general societal thing, but I think, you know, just the, the city hall people, the Jetro, um, any kind of industry associations, like for us, it would be the, um, the JNTO, Japan mm. National Tourism Organization. And, and actually something else I was going to mention is... Uh, you know, if, if I was in New Zealand and I was coming over, I really wanted to, you know, start a business here, even if, you know, it was just a, a new branch of the company or something. 
what I would do is actually relocate here for maybe two months or something, three months. Mm. So, you know, get an Airbnb or, you know, a temporary apartment. It doesn't have to be Tokyo. You can, you could choose another city and just, just live here and work, work remotely for, um, for three months. I think you'd make so many observations just that would um, save you a lot of money, you know, and time. Yeah. We had an episode come out recently with some people from New Zealand who came mm-hmm. over and did a, it was like a three week trip yeah. uh, visiting their distributors and making you know sales calls and doing all sorts of things. Yeah. And they said, we learned more in three weeks than we would have learned in three years sitting in New Zealand trying yeah, to absolutely. do all this. So yeah, coming and using Tokyo Shifo or Japan Shifo to find somewhere to stay yeah, yeah, or whatever. Absolutely. Yeah. And, um, and set yourself up here for a bit and see what it's really like to be here. Yeah. It's great, great advice. Yeah. So anything that you are seeing coming in your crystal ball over there? Tourists. I think they're going to be coming back soon. So it's not really crystal ball gazing, but I, yeah, I think Japan should be completely open for business by, you know, summer, late summer, early, early autumn. So um, yeah, looking forward to that. Do you yeah. think Japan's going to go back to how it was before with just like um, millions of tourists overflowing kind of situation? Eventually, I think, yes, actually, I'm afraid. I think, um, but it's going to take a long time to ramp up to that. You can see it in New Zealand too. I mean, you've got different markets for Japan. Like obviously China is the biggest market and they're not going to be coming back for, for quite some time because, you know, that's all locked up. But for a lot of other people, if you're not, you know, if you're not China or Korea or Taiwan, Japan is a long haul destination. So, you know, you're typically talking a flight of 10 to 15 hours kind of thing. So it's kind of, in that way, it's kind of similar to New Zealand. And if, if you look at the tourism situation in New Zealand, you know, they've recently opened the borders. There hasn't been a huge flood. It's been a slow, a slow build up. And I think it'll be similar in Japan. It's, um, it's going to take people a while to, to come back in numbers. Oh, of course, I would like it to be different. I'd like it, you know, them to look at more sustainable ways of doing tourism, but yeah, ultimately it's um it's driven by by money. So if the same incentives to make money are, are still there, then you know the, it's just gonna happen again. It's gonna be the same kind of um you know tour buses and, and shopping sprees in, in Ginza and, and things like that. So I think it'd be great to see more tourism in the Japanese countryside. There's a lot of towns that are just dying and they need the the you know the input of um of inbound tourists. It's yeah, like I, yeah. I recently bought a house in Niigata, like a, a, an akia, like an empty mm-hmm. house. It's close to a lot of ski ski areas. And I think it gets the most snow of anywhere in the world. It's insane. We had 20 meters of snow this year. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> it was a big snow year, but yeah. It, yeah. Wow. Yeah. That's a lot of 20 snow. Meters. It, it was, God. um, I had the, the snow clearing guy taking the, the snow off my roof every, every few days so that mm. the house didn't fall down. Sure. But that, that village, that particular village I'm in, it's a place called Sekiyama. The city's called Miyoko. They have a, a city newspaper, like a, a thing they send out every every month. And they they put the birth and death notices on the on the back of the, the paper. Yeah, each each month is like there's usually about six to ten births, and there's usually thirty to forty deaths. This is a a city of like thirty five thousand people. So you can at that rate, you know, the the, mm. the place is going to lose 10,000 people within the next, you know, few years. They really need that, that uh, the money to come back, especially the ski areas. The, the ski areas yeah. are really struggling. Yeah, they must be really struggling, that's for sure. Yep. Yes, I can agree with you there being up here in Fukushima and yep. been wanting to have more people come and visit us here, especially on the coast. That was damaged the most. <laughs> Yeah, but yeah, nice. they just sort of never yeah. come this way. So, yes, yeah, so it would be lovely to have more sustainable tourism in the future going forward. Wouldn't that be nice? Yes. Yeah, yeah, it'd be, it'd yeah. be good. And anything yeah. else, Greg, you're saying gold mines of opportunities for primarily Kiwi businesses, because that's who we, we want to see here. But something that they could leverage, maybe the unique and fresh way that Kiwis do things. The area I know is tourism, but I would say, you know, these areas like the ski areas and the the experiences and the nature experiences and things. I think New Zealanders are really good at, at creating experiences around that. You know, look at the the guys out at uh, canyons and, and Gumma. Like guys like like him, I think are, are really mm. typical. They they kind of um, well not typical. He's he's pretty special, but I think that's the opportunity. Like you know, 
Japanese hardware with New Zealand software, if you know what I mean. Yeah. Something I don't think many people realize is the just the the natural assets of Japan. They tend to, you know, mm. see Kyoto and, and Tokyo and Osaka and stuff. But um, when I drive to my place in Niigata, I have to um, I have to go through Gunma and, and Nagano and the mountains and stuff. And every time I go through through there, I think, wow, this is like this is as good as you know you get in the Southern Alps and the best of the scenery in the South Island. Yeah. Given that you know New Zealand has New Zealanders have experience with that, and if inbound tourism tourists come back, then I think there's an opportunity there. Yeah, I'd say Japan's nature is definitely underdeveloped and ways to enjoy it. Yeah, that like yeah, yeah. Like, it's that, a bit that too New Zealanders... overdeveloped in some ways, like all the mm. concrete. But uh... yeah, I think New Zealanders could bring a a different way to enjoy nature that doesn't need any whistles and bells or mm-hmm. uh, mm. to you know like omiyage shops added to it or anything that. You know, we know how to enjoy nature without all that stuff. So yeah, yeah. Mm. I think the chat yeah. we were talking about there was uh, Mike Harris, right? Yes, Mike Harris. That's right. Yeah, but I've got your name there, Mike. We'll get you on the show <laughs> Mike, at some point. Can... We'd love to hear. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Awesome. Anything else, Greg, from you that would be really helpful? You think for like-minded Kiwi entrepreneurs, new business people thinking about coming into this lovely land of the rising sun i think the the biggest thing about japan is the it just tends to be quite intimidating because of the language i think if you can get past that then it's not actually that that difficult there you know there's there's, there's bureaucracy and things but i really like bureaucrats in japan i, I think like the bureaucracy in japan are generally really really helpful really nice yeah um <laughs> and and yeah, you know it's, sometimes they might say fill out this mm. form again or something but you know if you if you're humble and you ask for help and you treat people well, then I think that the bureaucracy in Japan treats you well in return. Mm, yeah, you just, you, I think mm. that's really good advice because it does, there is a lot of paperwork and literally paperwork. And you yeah. do have to write things out on the same form three times. I remember setting up my law firm bank account and had to write out the long name that it is. Yeah. 14 times and then once I made a mistake I had to put a line through it and redo it again so yeah and then you think oh this is really painful but it's just how it is and you just got to get with it right and and go with the flow there are so many other joyous things yeah there's a lot of licenses and things which are a bit bit annoying but uh yeah at the same time like um things like um the, the Japan Finance Corporation like right at the start of the um epidemic we were I mean, before the epidemic came along, we were, we were going to apply for a, a JFC loan. Um, the Japan Finance Corporation is a, a Japanese, um, I'm not sure if you call it government. Is it Japanese, like, like semi-government kind of I think it's thing? Quasi, yeah, quasi-government quasi government yeah. organization. And, and their, their job is to um, provide loans to small and medium-sized businesses. So uh, we, we had a plan to apply for a loan from them. And then the pandemic came along when we already started the process so uh we ended up getting a loan which has been very helpful for for getting us through and it's you know there's a lot of paperwork but it was actually kind of easy it was um a loan for i can say a loan for 20 million yen which is like 200,000 new zealand dollars mm. is that 200,000 mm. yeah yes I, i'm see, you can tell how long i've been in Japan. i have trouble <laughs> converting numbers yeah so yeah it's about more than 200,000 New Zealand dollars. And, you know, they said you don't have to pay any interest for the first two years. And after that, the rate is, you know, tiny. Mm. And it would be hard to find that kind of thing in New Zealand, I think. At the time, I was thinking, um, you know, there's so many reasons they'll reject us. It's like, you know, the the parent companies in Hong Kong, you know, we're foreigners. Um, <laughs> so you know, dodgy. <laughs> all, all sorts of stuff. But, you know, they, they gave us, um, they came through and they gave us the money. So. Yeah, they're great, aren't they? And I mean, I had a, I had one of their loans at the very beginning of my business, and I was I remember going to the bank and asking, and they said, "Oh, that's all done through the the JFC, and you know, we'll get you introduced to them, and you know, you're just like really just like a ramen shop, Catherine. Your business is like a ramen shop." And I was like, <laughs> "A noodle shop? What? I'm a law firm. What are you talking about?" And I, I look back, I think that was an affectionate, loving comment from the bank manager because. <laughs> I was just like one of them, you know, that right. they were running a little business and needed to have some support. And yeah. sort of he was seeing me through that lens. And I thought that was really actually quite a cool thing is that if you try to start a business here and you are small, they know that you need support. 
So comparing a, a small entrepreneurial business, even if it's a law firm, had nothing to do with it. It was really, you were just trying to get yourself going and they were really happy to help. Yep. 95% yep. of businesses in Japan being small and medium sized. So thanks for sharing that story and reminding me because that's a, that's a great one, right? There is help here if we need it. It is for Japanese companies, but you know, if you're, if you're from New Zealand and you come here and set up a Japanese company, then you're, you qualify, you know? Exactly. Mm -hmm. Wow. Yeah, awesome. Any promotions or activities that you're doing that you'd like to share with us? Just, um, you know, visit the website Maybe, I mean, we're looking for, we're always looking for writers. You know, if you're interested in sharing your, your knowledge about Japan or, um, you know, traveling around Japan, then, you know, get in touch. Great. Yeah, awesome. Perfect. Do you need any articles about Fukushima? <laughs> uh, Fukushima, yeah, definitely. Definitely. I, th I think Fukushima is going to be huge in the future, actually. I think it like, is um, too. Yep. It's just because of the, it's, it kind of sounds a bit cynical, but it's just because of the name rec recognition. Everyone in, in uh, outside Japan knows Hiroshima and Nagasaki. So, you know, mm. yes. um, tragic um, circumstances that made them famous. But, you know, they're, they're on the, the map in, in yes. Japan mm. because of that, you know. It is. So, yes, yep. we would love to see more visitors coming here. It's definitely would be very welcome. We can take a few from Kyoto and all those other very busy places up here and nobody would know. Yeah. <laughs> Blend right in. Well, thank you so much for coming on the show today and giving us your insights as what it's like to be a jando in Japan in your industry and some very valuable insights too they were. Thank you so much. Thanks no so much, Greg. Actually, I should say jandal, jandal is one of my favorite New Zealand words. It's a Japanese sandal. Oh, I, I tell everyone right, about it. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. We're glad. <laughs> Did that entice you to come on the show, Greg? <laughs> no, no, I just, I just, I just think it's awesome. Like, uh, you know, I, I don't think there's a better word for it. Thongs, you know, all that. Yeah, nah. It doesn't, yeah. Nah, nah, yeah, yeah, nah. nah. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks so much for being such a successful jandal in Japan. We really no enjoyed it. Cheers. Bye. Well, Catherine, isn't Greg an awesome jandal in Japan? I really loved having him on the show today. He sure is. Gosh, he's trodden in his jandals across Japan <laughs> for so many years. And gosh, he's done so well considering there's been a few battlefields along the way. He's really, really shown that spirit of being a great entrepreneur and going forward, forward, forward. Yeah, not giving up. And I think that's an important message we've had across a lot of episodes is just sticking at it, sticking at it, don't give up. And we all um, do that in business, but in a different country when there's a real chance to just jump on an airplane and like, I've had enough, but just to keep going, I think really shows the spirit of strong Kiwis in Japan. Mm. Mm. And it was really great to see that, you know, the Japanese government does support businesses that are run by foreigners here in Japan, just like they do other businesses, you know, Japanese businesses. And he mentioned the loan that he was able to get for his company because it's registered in Japan. And I know there were a lot of other supports that came from the government as well during COVID for that's right. businesses. Yes. Yeah. I think that's a good thing. And one of the takeaways really would be don't dismiss any support that might be coming locally. And he talked about the loan from the government, but also he talked about connections with the government people. Mm. You know, he talked about Jetro and JNTO and the city office officials where we, yes. you know, we're down at those offices all the time, aren't we? Renewing different kinds of uh, documents and things that we need or getting documents or getting copies of documents and things. So having a good relationship with those people was also uh, something that perhaps some of our other guests haven't pulled out yet. Mm. Uh, really good comments to make there. Yeah, those awesome. people at the City Hall are lovely as well, aren't they? Which I think is yeah, yeah. really nice. Yeah, and his sort of crystal ball gazing of sort of noticing the untapped nature that there is in Japan that New Zealanders yes. know how to make the most of because we have a lot of it, right? And we're not allowed to put concrete down and do all those things that sometimes happens in Japan. So if you can bring your Kiwi skills of helping people to enjoy nature, whether that's through guiding or setting up some kind mm. of adventure, mm. Japan has so many places that are just waiting for people to start doing things like so that, true. rafting or rock climbing or something, you know, we have I loads of that thought, stuff. Wouldn't mm. it be great if we could get a coast to coast in Japan where it may not have to be a whole coast to coast, but you can think east to west Japan or part prefecture to prefecture is not that hard and like 
do a cycling tour or something that New Zealand's really, really good at and bring a bit of that here and, and expand on that. I've always thought that would be quite a good thing to do. Mm. Well, the coast to coast. A coast to coast. In, yeah. yeah. In Japan, coast to coast. That would be very cool. Right. Mm, I wonder mm. how that would go because, yeah, things like trail running and uh, cycling are definitely uh, picking up here. More cycle trails are being built all over the place and trail running is becoming more and more popular. Exactly. Mm. So think about and the collaborations. Spectacular. Mm. Yeah, think about, you know, we will be hearing as well from other people who are doing all sorts of things. But if you think about Don Roxburgh and his health bars, I mean, imagine taking those on your cycling trip, right? Mm, mm. And then having a classic uh, wine or a sparkling at the end, right, to celebrate and all collaborations that could happen amongst New Zealand companies to bring that together. Gosh, Jane, we're bouncing out some ideas here. <laughs> yeah, but I know Greg exciting. did see the p- potential there. And the mm. other last point I'd like to say is I thought it was really good that he didn't, he said that don't focus just on language. Having someone who's really good at language is a, is a good thing. You can mm. hire a, an interpreter or a translator, but getting the person with the expertise on the ground, and that might mm. be a foreigner, it might be a Japanese person who may not have perfect English or Japanese in either case, but their expertise and knowledge and insights and skills in their particular uh, genre, their int- industry would be the best thing to have. And I thought that was a really good way of um, explaining how to do it otherwise you're going into as he called it fishing in the same pool for all the talent in this little area and you could Mm. be expanding further otherwise you'll miss the right person for Mm. your particular business here definitely yeah well a lot of gold in there for this episode thank you so much greg for being a great jandal and he even told us that jandal is his favorite word how funny is that yay 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 well that's it subscribe if you liked it subscribe so you don't miss out on another episode and we look forward to seeing you again on another episode of Jandals in Japan. Cheers. Bye. Cheers. Bye. Thanks for listening. Make sure you check out our guests links in the show notes. This podcast is brought to you today by Catherine O'Connell Law and Pod Launch with Jane. If you have a great story you think should be on the show, come and find us on LinkedIn or Instagram. We'd love to hear from you. See you next time. Mata ne!